Okay. Now everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Ian Unruh. I'm Vice President of the Kansas State YL. And uh, it's not always a public speaker, so this will just be short. Um, our first featured speaker is Cody Wolfson, who is known by Wired Magazine as one of the 15 most dangerous people in the world. Um, he founded Defense Distributed and Deathcat, which are two, two organizations dedicated to defending the Second Amendment by uh, spreading 3D printable gun designs to uh, everyone that can, uh, everyone who needs them. And uh, Cody and I share a common interest in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, uh, along with uh, free markets and private law. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Cody Wilson. that I like which says, um, you know, I'm not here to break into a bigger prison, I'm here to break all prisons. And I really like that. I think there's something else in the American spirit about hostility, decentralized authority, decentralized power. I think it's, it's part of who we are as a nation. This suspicion of institution and an anti-authoritarian, like an anti-authoritarian generally. So with that, my name is Cody Wilson. I'm the head of a project called Defense Distributed. I'm like hearing some feedback. Is there? Yeah, I'll go over that. The technology in this room is not the greatest. No, it's <laughs> So, you know, I bring you good tidings from the industry. <laughs> my, my organization, Defense Distributed, publishes 3D printing gun related files. And we started a project around 3D printing because, oh, that's fine. Um, how could I, that's fine. How can I like advance the slides? Right here. Okay. So just the little button in the central. Uh, to the right. All right, can you guys still hear me in the back? Yeah. Yeah, so. We built a project around 3D printing, one, because we realized the cultural fascination that 3D printing had, and so I, I don't think we're as impractical as, if you've heard of us, we're as impractical as maybe you think. Uh, I realized that guns have been made in this country for a long time, guns can be milled, laid, uh, reliable materials, and in fact, I think many of literati, the East and West Coast types, didn't realize that themselves, and so when you combine a phenomenon like 3D printing and guns, and then tell people, oh, look how easy it is to make a gun component, uh, there's just this code, just a slit on um, but that is somewhat of the goal. But I think 3D printing is, is more successful in, in making guns and gun parts than you might think. And so before I get into why I'm here, and the fact that I'm really just here to radicalize you, this is all propaganda, uh, and succeed. Um, that's why I agreed to do this. Uh, I should at least demonstrate that, like, uh, what do I point at? There you go. Yeah. I should at least demonstrate why I began this. Um, so there's a, there's a guy named Bree Pettis, he is the founder of MakerBot Industries and a piece of technology called the MakerBot, which is the most popular retail 3D printer. He was at South by Southwest uh, Festival in Austin and he unveiled a new, a new product called the, the Digitizer. And this is where 3D printing is moving right now this year. The ability to scan all objects and put them into repositories and easily replicate on 3D printers. So he says, you know, in a world of digitizing anything, how do you digitize? Cupcakes and flowers in here. And he says, uh, he uses the example of the lineup. When I get it, it's neutral, it's that's what I was talking about. Mm, that's what I'm here. Fill the world with lineups. Make a lot of Fill the world with lineups. This is a literal quote. And I'm like, you know, at this point, I've been thinking months about this. And there's, there's this press about the maker revolution, the revolutionary device, and a revolutionary manufacturer. Obama himself used it in the City of the Union. Revolutionary manufacturer. Of course, this is just advertising. I'd like to sell you a tour. I thought if a, if a 3D printer could be revolutionary, then, I mean, it should be able to make a gun? Maybe. What should I point out? Yeah. Okay. I'll just go back to this. This is Michael Gustick's partially printed pistol. It's the first time. I still don't know. Am I like pointing at the projector? I just don't know what to hit. Yeah. So Michael Gustick made a little bit of a splash when he partially printed a, a, an AR pistol with a, a plastic lower. Uh, from an, a used FDM Stratasys, maybe like a 10-year-old or 15-year-old machine. Uh, this is the lower receiver component of that pistol. And the imagination was set. Uh, the all was, oh my god, you can print guns with 3D printers. Like, I could not imagine, like people, 
they weren't ready for it. We were, we did not know he was doing this. We were working on this for, for months, I think, at the same time. And in fact, now Gus and I are good friends, and, and we talk about this uh, today. But this is where it all kind of begins, culturally. If a 3D printer could be a revolutionary device, well, then surely you can print a gun. And let's see what the logical extreme of that is. This is the beginning of my project. Can you print guns with 3D printers? That's the question. Um, I just feel like I'm... Oh, so it's like a delay. Yeah, just so, let me know. Yeah, no big deal. So cutting ahead, I'm just going to be like, man, you hit the space before I would come up with So I'm cutting ahead a little bit here. In fact, you probably are the first people to ever see this. We've been testing for the last two months gun components that will actually go into a 3D printed handgun. And most people know us for low receivers and magazines, and, and that's great. We wanted that with Sandy Hook. Uh, but this is a 3D printed gun barrel. And most people say, oh, gun barrels always have to be steel. Like, like they know. Uh, we did 11 rounds of 380 through this, this barrel. This printed ADS. It was readily, readily printed. Not just one round, not just two rounds, but 11 rounds of 380, which is a decent decent cartridge pressure. And, uh, I think I have one more. I pressed the button. Yeah. That's it from a different angle. So at about at around the 10th shot, uh, a crack formed uh, in the strong direction of the and rails we were done. We still put one more through it to break it. Um, but that's that's the 380 rotor. But you can see it's getting much, yeah, it's getting really dirty. But we put a little oil in there too to help with extraction. Extraction's a problem when you have 3D printed plastic barrels. Uh, the cartridge tends to melt in the bore. <laughs> um, but this is what we're known for right now, mostly 3D printing SLA, SLS, FDM, AR-15 lower receivers. I'm not sure if you can tell what this is, but this is the magazine well, support material. Uh, this is where your trigger group goes. This is your trigger in here. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and that's just kind of what people think we do right now. Oh, they make low receivers for AR-15. And that's really how it began. This is a Cuomo magazine that we made after New York passed its magazine ban. Just to you know, demonstrate the point that looks strong. It's a plastic box. You're not going to ban it. Same thing we did here for you. We developed the first standard capacity printable AR-15 and AK-47 magazine. This is a version of that worked really well. This is a, a fantastic gun range in Liberty Hill, Texas. I recommend it. It's called Best of the West. If you're ever out, let's go shooting. Um, and this is this is much as we've really developed in the AR-15. We've done handles too, and I think I have some collapsible stock and some uh, some AK stock and stuff we could do. So really, the whole underpart of an AR-15 is printable and usable, reliable, durable, uh, for all intents and purposes. So that's a uh, FDM printed magazine, FDM printed uh, low receiver. And when I say FDM, I mean fused deposition modeling, which is the cheaper technology in all. The umbrella of technologies of 3D printing. I'm really trying to get through this so I can radicalize you. Um, <laughs> this is in the back of Reason Magazine this month. I mean, it just kind of is uh, right the revoir of our, of our project. I mean, so, magazines, receivers, what are you going to do? Uh, it's printable now. It's easy. Less than 30 bucks a piece. You can make these things for yourself. That's our AK. I just think it's, you know, it's a beautiful inspiring shot. Um, my project begins with a simple YouTube video. Who am I? I'm nobody. I just decided to do this. And if I was going to do it, I didn't have any money, so I asked the internet for some money. And uh, the internet gave me some money, but, but not a whole lot, because I was, I was raising this on Indiegogo, I wanted some legitimacy, I, just, I didn't want, it, it seems so scammy. I started on 4chan and Reddit, by the way, and everyone was like, you know, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, they, this can't be real, this is a, this is a total scam. Uh, so I, I thought maybe I could use the credibility of another, like, crowdfunding organization, and uh, anyway, yeah, it kind of worked. So I, I don't know anything about fundraising or, or marketing or, or anything, I just began being who I am. And we raised $2,000 two in, in about 20 days. Uh, but the profile of the project was raised enough that uh, a bunch of liberals got really mad and flagged the project and it was taken down. So I lost all the money. It took, it took me another month to raise all the money through PayPal and the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, which maybe we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and then, so I'm like, oh, okay, great. Wow, wow, that was difficult. Let's, let's lease a 3D printer. <laughs> and, you know, as soon as I did, they found out who I was and, and they took it back from me. And this is, this is once the project really got, got to a new height, a new profile. Because I think this was the first time this had happened in this way, <laughs> that a company actually took back its piece of capital for, I mean, what am I trying to say? I was using it for its intended purpose, not violating its terms of use, and they were saying, you know what, on second thought, no, we're not like do business with you. And also, we're going to criminally rephrase the ATF. Uh, that happened, so I wrote. And that was an interesting two hours. <laughs> if, if you don't know, uh, a criminal referral to the ATF and a firearms violation are, are pretty much life-endings. And we know in the United States, if you're a, a felon, 
especially well on a firearms conviction, assuming you make it out of prison alive, you're a second class citizen for the rest of your life, and of course you lose your firearms rights. So this project was in mortal danger uh, in more ways than one, and uh, I have Stratasys Incorporated to thank for that. So, oh, I'm going to New York, by the way, at the an Inside 3D Printing Conference. It's an industry conference in just a few days, and believe me, I'm going to give Stratasys a piece of my mind. Um, we begin printing these, finally, once I was able to, uh, you know, secretly lease a printer in Austin. This is, uh, I mean, it was crazy. It was, it was some of the most clandestine stuff. <laughs> it was like, do you, yeah. And it's such an insular community. They were afraid of that, and to this day, they still are. The people that lease me time on printers, and we own some now, but the people that still lease me time on printers still do not share with anyone what they're doing because the supply chains are so limited, the market is so cornered that they don't want to, you know, piss off the... Uh, get cut off like I did, basically. So, I mean, we're, we're still in a terrible situation. This is the first uh, printed error 15 low receiver we, we made. We made it in object materials. They're very expensive materials, uh, but they approximate uh, ABS plastic on, the, on their material sheet. I'm going too slow right now, but um, this is from my, this is Michael Gussick's design that was hosted on a site called Thingiverse, which was uh, and is related to MakerBot Industries. It's one of the biggest 3D printing repositories online. So, we tested his piece first. We wanted to follow his footsteps while we were waiting for a federal firearms license um, because eventually I wanted to be able to print whole guns and for some legal reasons that we might be able to get into. You, you've got to be licensed up to do some of this. We broke it. We broke it on YouTube, um, more or less infamously, I guess, and the, the press at the time was, I think, uh, collectively relieved. Oh, good. They don't work. Uh, and this was just like, no, we're, we're printing low receivers. Uh, this, this is a good showcase of all the different technologies we used to print lowers at the time and some of the different iterations we did. You, you probably can't see the details, but these reflect a lot of changes in software, a lot of different um, ideas based off assumptions we ran in SOLIDWORKS simulation and some other software. So FD imprinted ABS, Object Bureau Clear Plastic, um, this, is a, this is another black ABS, SLA resin, object materials. Um, we just wanted to see how these things performed. I mean, there isn't a body of information out there about this, especially when you're building gun parts. Um, did I? ka -chow. Right. So, these begin breaking in different places, though, and we're excited because we begin chasing the, the failures all over the piece, and we realize, okay, we, it breaks at 6, breaks at 30, breaks at 100, okay, we're making progress. And at that point, I brought in some MEs, or mechanical engineers, I'm sorry, I was just, just jargon every day. Um, and we begin actually getting pretty serious about this, raising money, and designing lowers that begin not failing really at all, and begin becoming expensive to test. Um, this is an SLA printed lower, one of the first ones to get us to 100 rounds. Uh, this is what it looks like to test one of these in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So this is a displacement model. Yeah, exactly. So what you can do is uh, you don't have to just waste money on, on printing these things. Software uh, iteration and simulation allow you to test your assumptions first. Uh, and this is, this is a lot of what we do now. So um, when we get what we think are significant improvements, we'll, we'll print them out and test them. We got to a place with our lowers, by the way, where we uh, were very satisfied with them. In fact, where we stopped development. We begin attracting, and this is the second part of this project that I hoped had, would happen, it happened earlier than I thought. We begin attracting mediocre politicians, <laughs> right? Who are both bemused, confused, you know, awed by this technology. And, you know, this is security theater at its finest. This is the whole, like, post-TSA 9-11 thing. Oh my god, 3D printers mean 3D printed guns, therefore illegal. Um, that's what this guy represents. And in fact, he's introduced a bill uh, that I'll tell you about later, but this Freudian gem was created by this man. Um, law enforcement officials should have the power to stop homemade high-capacity magazines from proliferating with a Google search. This tells you that the permissive liberal is a myth, and that Democrats will do anything to stop guns, including step on your internet. This site, after Sandy Hook, Thingiverse, the 3D printing repository I talked about, took gun files down after Sandy Hook. I had to launch this site to put them back up. I did. Pirate Bay also helped me out. The most, uh, the most popular, you can't see this, but the most popular seeded files in the Pirate Bay in the physical category, physical being 3D printed related files, by far are our files. We've downloaded um, from our servers alone over 600,000 files. We've done seven terabytes of traffic since the end of December. Um, I know that just, I mean, this is 80 seeders, 41 seeders, 25 seeders down here. We, we know that there have been millions of downloads of these files, probably at least 2 million. Uh, we've got we've got repositories on uh, Kim.com service mega as well. Uh, it's just a beautiful picture of uh, the first time we got a Cuomo mag to do like 600 rounds of. I mean, it's a 3D printed magazine. It'll run hundreds and hundreds of rounds. Uh, I think this is on auto at this point. 
Alright, and I've relaunched. <laughs> I'm not pressing the button. It's just like by sheer will. Um, so I've relaunched this site, and in fact, this will come up a little bit later, um, if not this month, early next month, as a as a. It'll be a 3D printing search engine uh, where you'll be able to search not just for files and find them, but also develop on them. Am I? Yeah, there we go. So you'll be able to download magnet link style. You'll be able to uh, develop in Git, change the files yourself, iterate very quickly. Upload your own stuff, 3D print from a number of, of services if you want, even buy um, someone else's commercial version of the file. So we think we're, we'll try to create a 3D printed hub, if you will, but that's not really, that's just advertising for a project. I'm here to radicalize you. Um, and I, I, this, this is optimistic for me. So, what does defensive security represent? We wanted to kill the spirit of gun control, not just a technical proof that gun control is impossible, that was already true, but to over demonstrate it, to overkill it, and to basically use the progressive. Um, mentality about freedom of information, confuse it and mix it with, yes, also firearms. Um, make firearms information, freedom of firearms. Right? It's very easy, but in execution it's somewhat uh, difficult. The, uh, the, the permissive liberal is a myth. This is what I want to talk about. Every Democrat, every congressman is a Steve Israel. They all are reactionaries. They represent reactionary institutions from the revelations of an earlier day. They will always try to stop and stand in the way of people being able to liberate themselves act independently. In fact, he's introduced the bill to the House Judiciary Committee. Yes, it's great that Manchin Toomey is dead. You know, great. But he's introduced the bill to the House Judiciary Committee, which would make it specifically illegal for you to make for yourself a plastic printed AR-15 receiver and a plastic printed uh, magazine. Now, what's interesting about this? It wouldn't be illegal to commercially make it or to do this on a license. It would just be illegal for you to do it. He's not attacking He's attacking the expediency of being able to make a gun part with the dead letter law from uh, the 1980s. He doesn't want you to be able to do these things easily. He is a reactionary, and all, all technologies have to confront these people. Let's show them for who they are. Uh, and then a symbolic challenge, and this one gets a little bit deep. Uh, but basically the idea is take the challenge from the physical into the symbolic. When a 3D printer, which might actually be a relatively ubiquitous device, can reproduce anything, specifically a gun, what kind of grand system of systems could possibly regulate that? And in fact, my challenge is, please, regulate it. Because in that challenge alone, I, I see something of an impossible overbidding. The system cannot bear the weight of something like that. Even like the most magnificent post-9-11 massive surveillance state must crumble when every single person in the world and in the country is a potential criminal who could print a gun. That's something I want. Um, and I think that's it. That's the you know defense distributed. So why am I here? And I'm not managing my time well. So like let me know. But I'm here. And why did I begin? Because I believe in the post-political moment. I believe that politics is really the institution for achieving radical equality, and that's its proper mode as an institution. It doesn't mean well how do we statutorily navigate the general will? How do we choose some of our rulers? This is a lie, and this is a lie that's been foisted upon you. It's almost a miracle that we're all here today. I don't think politics means working on a campaign or red team or blue team. And that's easy to say, maybe. But let me get at this just a little bit more, okay? I'm planting some seeds now, right? So, at the end of the Cold War, there's this new liberal democratic consensus that really everything's going to be the liberal state and capitalism and every, all political questions are simply questions of social administration and more or less harassment of law-abiding people. And we can just disagree about the details. Uh, this is disgusting and in fact declares like the end of ideology in my mind. I think ideology is still important. I think technologies like Bitcoin and 3D printing show that ideology is important and will become more and more important. And I want you to be focusing on these potentialities rather than the hard realities of power politics, which I see so many student libertarians doing, like, oh, I'll go join this campaign or oh, I'll go to academia. No, listen to me. Alright. <laughs> There's two, in, in this attitude, I, it, it, I met a, a Metamesis guy one time, he's a good friend of mine. But, uh, I met him at an airport, he was wearing the bow tie, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, mean, I have no problem with this institution. Molinari and Mises, like, great, great stuff, right? But there's too much of an affinity and a, a close relationship with power itself. I mean, too much of a collusion with these institutions. Like, a, there, there's somewhat of a, a, bitter, a bitter realism, and you compromise your youth and I think your imagination when you too quickly fall in line with, with, with some of these political players. And I, I know that everybody wants to be important, everybody wants to do something, but uh, resist this temptation to get Potomac fever, go to the Hill, work in high finance, work in academia. If these are your passions, fine. But like, believe me, you have other means of, of executing this political vision, which you all seem to share. You believe in a world of, of equality and a greater liberty that most of your contemporaries 
can't even express. You can imagine it, and yet you're going to go into high finance? Uh, please, listen to me just a little bit. <laughs> I think the proper attitude is not one of like love for power or, or affinity for it, or, or somehow working with it. Oh, I'll work within the system. I mean, this is the Marxist debate about this all through the last century. That, oh, do we as communists and Marxists work with the progressives or work within the Democratic Party? I mean, uh, Republicans are talking about this now. Libertarians are talking about this now. Do we work with them? No. You should have a hostility, a suspicion, and a reverence to all forms of political authority in this current society. That's your proper mode, your critical thinkers. And you should express this through, through all kinds of, I guess, not just disruptive ways, but entrepreneurial ways, okay? So uh, Slavoj Žižek, a, a favorite philosopher of mine, says it's easier to imagine the end of the world itself, like an apocalyptic like, you know, meteor hitting the earth and destroying it, than imagining the end of neoliberal democratic capitalism. <laughs> it's easier to imagine in the world than the end of this present state of affairs. So I'm telling you, it's your job to not only just imagine that, now here's back and then, right? Not just dream this future society, but to create the facts of this future society. One of the facts of this future society is you'll be able to print a gun. I guarantee it. I'm going to do it to a right? You'll be able to print a gun. Maybe that's not a big deal, but it's a fact of the future society. It's a fact that we'll all have to deal with. Same thing with Bitcoin. Maybe if you're not you know, up to speed on it or critical of it, fine. Uh, there's always going to be these, these massive fluctuations, and it's, it's a very small economy. Right? But there's a place for a, a cryptocurrency like this, behind strong cryptographic control, that will allow anonymous markets. That will be a fact of the future, and we'll have to deal with it. So create the facts of that future, be entrepreneurial, and do it in a way that, like, do it in a way that you can make some money. I'm not against markets or even wages, so I'm, I'm not like just a purely traditional anarchist or anything. I, just, I think you should be, um, don't be afraid to be imaginative. Don't, don't take on this bitter realism. Um, and here's a, here's a quote from Landar. The state is a condition. I'm not telling you you have to, I know there's conservatives here, don't get me wrong. But the state is a condition, okay? It's a mode of behavior. He, he's a lesser known school from, or a lesser known anarchist from the traditional school, but he said, he basically explained the state as a, as a condition of relationships. When we create new relationships with ourselves, with, with other people, we disintermediate the state from our lives. It's not even the violent overthrow of the state, right? It's just the obligation of it. I mean, if I can send you Bitcoin for doing work for me and you send it back for me, where's our intermediate? Where's our expedient state? It's no longer necessary. It disappears. This is the, this is the slow social revolution that perhaps some of the 19th century people thought about, but they didn't have the technology. Um, so I employ you, no more campaigns, no more poli sci, no more academia, no more high finance. And here's a Thoreau quote, all right? So I'm not going to challenge you a little bit. And I left it on my phone. I just wanted to get it right. Well, uh, I'll, I won't okay. Basically, the idea is, the idea is, you guys are some of the biggest critics and theorists and, and really um, gadflies of the present order, right? If you're some of its biggest critics, and I'm talking about the government, the state here, and yet, you still give it your allegiance, and you yield to it, your support? Are you not then its most conscientious supporters? Are you not then its most conscientious supporters if you know exactly what's wrong with it, and yet still yield to it your support? In the end, aren't you the greatest obstacles to reform? Because you're all gonna go to the hill, or you're all gonna go into high finance, and yet you are the wise and intelligent minority that could do something about it because you have the vision and the ability to execute. So I'd say, don't be that. If Someone's going to build this world, it's going to be you. Build that world. That's it. Yeah, it's fine. I don't, know. I don't want to run over anyone's time. We have about four minutes, so take <coughs> questions. A couple questions, please. <coughs> yeah. uh, don't you think that you can, uh, you were talking about building the world, and uh, don't you think that you can build this world through the system? No, you can't. You can't yield to it your allegiance, you can't give it to your support. This no, is, you can work through the system this, while not yielding to it. This falls a disciplinary desire. This is wanting to have your cake and eat it too. Basically, it's the idea that, like, oh, well, I'll get out of the end. No, you won't. Um, you literally... I, I just think that history bears testament to this fact. It just simply does. You're never going to vote in the revolution. You're never going to put enough libertarians in high, in high office to make it happen. It's not built to do that. All right, just to use Rousseau, right? I'm never going to vote away the state through the... Through the it's, it's, it's like Marx itself. We're going to use the state to abolish the state. Now we've got 200 years of showing that that's never going to work. You uh, talked about all the opposition you've encountered from permissive liberals. Uh, given, as you mentioned, that there's other inexpensive ways of producing firearms, what is it about 3D printing that really scares people who love government power? 
I think what this is is uh, it was celebrated for just just a bit as this as liberal first, as oh people power and oh look what we'll be able to do and all oh, means of production and they they just weren't <laughs> they just weren't anticipating the gun and so I just think it's a powerful symbol at the right moment culturally. I think it's all it is. It's it's tech. It's the tech press has got it. The literati have got it. It's just the right time to introduce. Oh yes, also gun. Uh, guns as software, it just like scares people, and, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great way to unpack the ideas of crypto anarchy, um, oh, which we didn't really talk about, did we? <laughs> yeah, in the back, yeah. standing up, yeah. Yeah, do you think the same argument, the same philosophy that you're approaching would be the same for the war on drugs? The same if the I mean, everybody will just have, have sophisticated ways of making meth in the bathroom or something like that? Yeah, in fact, probably not, it probably won't have to be in your bathroom. There's a guy named Lee Cronin working on a, a device called the Computer, which is doing exactly this. It's kind of like the 3D printing of, of simple drugs and reagents. That will only get better. Um, and I mean, if, you, if we want to draw it out all the way, there will be material molecular assembly one day at a, at a very small level. I mean, I, come on, if, assuming we don't get swallowed up into the sun anytime soon, <laughs> this, uh, this could be drawn out for a long time. It's going to end up one day where you'll just be able to materialize things, I think. But I'm not really trying to be a 3D printing evangelist. Maybe this ends at some obvious result at some point because materials can't develop at a, you know, it's logarithmic. There's just a long process where things don't get much more complex. Um, but of course, I, I think the, the two share a resemblance. So look at the technical instead of the philosophical. It, at this point in time, are 3D printers pretty limited to plastic or are they more, is there something on the horizon that would be a stronger material that is perhaps uh, able to be used to print a stronger barrel? Uh, yeah, so ne there's one, nanomaterials and advancements in polymers are, yeah, they're very strong polymers. There's open source uh, 3D printing ceramic projects. There's, of course, 3D printing in metal. There's SLS and SLA technologies, which can be uh, work with and center composites. So really, the, it's, a, it's a pretty wide field, even now. Um, but the most successful stuff to date is, is still the ABS and PLA plastics. And yeah. do you know what uh, products they're using to produce organs, human organs, mm -hmm. with the... Uh, with uh, products? Um, I, I know that there's a, one company in particular that's about to go public that has... Yeah, there's a, there's a couple companies right now that do what is called bioprinting, tissue printing, and what will eventually become organ printing. Um, the technology is slightly different, but basically at, at the cellular level it's the same It's the same thing, the kind of molecular assembly. Um, those technologies are interesting to me, but they, they're really captured by corporatist and you know biomedical interests. So I would like to see like an open source version of that. It's just who knows, 20 years from, I mean, that's expensive stuff. You know, you gotta have a lab and FDA approved on everything. Yeah? Uh, could you name drop a few of your favorite uh, open source printer <coughs> designs right now? Designs? Uh, just, um, yeah, what, what's your favorite? What do you think is the best value for In 3D printing? Consumer 3D do you printers? mean the printers themselves or the things they can print? Uh, 3D printers. Uh, Ultimaker, I don't recommend the RepRap. I, I feel like they messed up recently. I know that they're friends of, of Freedom generally and the fact that like, the way that Bill Gates is a friend of Freedom, like, Helping everyone have a computer, but um, I like the Ultimaker. I like the RepRap project. The RepRap project is where really everything begins. So check out RepRaps; those are affordable. And then I like hacking Stratasys machines. Um, so taking a Stratasys, printing out the things that break its EEPROM and its cartridges, and saying like, "Oh, look! I used your machine to break your machine." Um, <laughs> and like, how could they have not anticipated you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Who does the ceramic? No, it's an open source project. Now, so the Lithos in Austria has a commercial uh, ceramic printer. It's way too expensive, but I, I forget the name. I, I really should have remembered this. But check it out. There's an open source uh, RepRap style ceramic project. It's kind of like a, it's being compared to like building sandcastles, and um, it's worth checking out. Yeah. Can, can you explain uh, crypto anarchy? I would love that. I would love to explain crypto anarchy. In 20 seconds. <laughs> crypto anarchy is expressed by a guy named Tim May in the late 80s and what he called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Basically, the idea is like technologies would allow the virtual implementation of anarchic relationships instead of its real implementation. So we would have things like zero knowledge uh, debt pool markets, crypto commerce. We would have things like WikiLeaks, which he predicted. We'd have things like Bitcoin. We'd have things like 3D printed guns. As bandwidth and hard drives and memory increase, we'd be able to pass greater and greater, more important things to each other without intermediation like I've talked about and this would allow basically uh, the kind of freedom we imagine, the clipping of barbed wire fences, the destruction of intellectual property. Um, yeah, that's coming. All right. So thank you. <laughs>
by all means. Um, so let's take a quick break, uh, 10 minutes, just to get a chance to stretch your legs, mingle with some sponsors, and we'll be back here by 11.